This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. This last year, we focused on Silent Spring. And we focused on ethical issues related to the environmental impacts of Silent Spring. But tonight, we're going to have a different focus. Rachel Carson was a female scientist. And along the way, especially during her production of Silent Spring, she encountered a lot of challenges that were associated with being a woman scientist both a woman scientist and a writer. And one big, big reason for that is because Silent Spring was a major challenge to some of the big chemical industries in the United States and around the world. And so these industries really wanted to see if they could discredit <coughs> Rachel Carson. And so they attacked her in a very large extent as a woman. It was commonly said, oh, she's hysterical. We all know that women are very emotional. They can't think rationally and logically. And so you shouldn't pay attention to this work. They, when there were photographs of her, she was commonly in a domestic setting. There were children around her, or she was in a garden with birds. Very rarely did they photograph her in a setting where she came across as the scientist that she really was. And in fact, the Secretary of Agriculture, Urza Taft Benson, in an effort to discredit her, wrote a letter to President Eisenhower and said, she must be a communist because she's unmarried and no attractive woman would be unmarried at her age if she wasn't a communist. <laughs> Remember in that era, that was the ultimate way to discredit anyone uh, to the public. Right? So a lot of these things were associated with her being a female scientist. It was 50 years ago. A lot has changed in 50 years. But we're not where we should be. For example, if we look at graduate students in the sciences across the United States, they're 50% female, 50% male, very closely to 50-50. But when we look at the number of professors in science and engineering across the United States, female scientists and engineers are still widely underrepresented. So clearly, there are things that we need to do today. And that will be the focus of our discussion tonight. We have three really influential scientists and science communicators here to talk to you tonight. And they'll discuss issues remaining and answer questions and have a discussion with you as an audience. I'm going to introduce them all now. And then they will come up here, give a short explanation of their perspective on things. And after that, the panel will come on stage for a question answer period. So we'll begin. The, the first person who will speak tonight is Lynn Friedman. Lynn is a, was trained as a journalist and a marine biologist. So she has a lot in common with Rachel Carson from that perspective. She's a freelance writer. She's written very widely in science and technology. She's had many leadership positions in the National Science Writers Association and also in AWIS, the Association of Women in Science. In addition to that, she's one of the founding board members of Athena, a San Diego organization to promote <coughs> women entrepreneurs and women scientists. The second speaker tonight is Christina Deckard. Christina has master's degrees in physics and mathematics. She's a scientist at SPA War, has 
been very influential at Spa Ward, won numerous awards for her contributions to science and engineering. She's a, local, a member of the local association of women the Society of Women Engineers, and had a big influence there in terms of trying to promote more women entering the field of engineering. In addition to that, she's really made a lot of contributions in ensuring STEM education reaches people in K through 12 across our community. The third speaker, who's probably stuck in traffic at the moment, <laughs> is Dorothy Sears. She has a PhD from Johns Hopkins, uh, and I should point out that Rachel Carson also was attended Johns Hopkins, so there's another comparison with our speakers tonight. She's a professor at UCSD and does research on obesity and diabetes. Very prominent nationally, she's the president of the American Diabetes Association and the president of the San Diego chapter of the Association for Women in Science. So we're going to ask each of these three speakers to come up and give a short talk, one after the other. Then they will move up to the stage, and when they're up here on the stage, we'll open up the audience for questions, and that will be your opportunity to make comments or ask questions and interact with the speakers. Then. Well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes? OK, great. Uh, by virtue of the coin toss, I will start the discussion this evening talking about uh, 50 years after Silent Spring, the media landscape for women in science. And I'll be sharing with you my experience and perspectives from a 30-year career as a science writer and editor. Um, I will cover the media landscape that faced Rachel Carson, that playing field today, and um, ways that you personally can influence that landscape moving forward. Now, as many of you know, Silent Spring was not Rachel Carson's first book. Previously, she had written two bestsellers, The Sea Around Us and The Edge of the Sea. Both were published while she was still an employee of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And from the get-go, uh, her success rankled both the literary and scientific communities because Carson was viewed by both camps as being an outsider. Uh, with only a master's uh, degree in zoology and without a literary pedigree, this woman editor of government wildlife publications produced a scientific book for the public and became an overnight sensation. Some excerpts from author Linda Lear's authoritative biography on Rachel Carson will give you a flavor of the treatment that Carson received when The Sea Around Us was published in 1951. And uh, quoting from the book, the sexism that greeted Carson's uh, and her sudden fame is not as surprising as its blatant crudeness is striking. Many male readers, and certainly the scientific community, were reluctant to admit that a woman could deal with a scientific subject of such scope and complexity. Perhaps, thinking Rachel Carson was a pen name, one reader wrote into a publication, I assume, from the author's knowledge, that he must be a man. <laughs> But such attitudes were not limited to her readers. Almost every male who reviewed the book speculated about what a woman who, you know, what about a woman who could write such a book might look like. And even a praiseworthy review that appeared in the New York Times regretted that the book's publishers had not printed a photograph of Miss Carson on the jacket. Quote, it would be pleasant to know what a woman looks like who can write about an exacting science with such beauty and precision. And even one of her Oxford University Press editors, upon meeting Carson after the book was published, remarked, you are such a surprise to me. I thought you would be a very large and forbidding woman. <laughs> A Boston Globe article is another telling example. From correspondence, we know that Carson talked at length during the interview about her early interest in the sea and her scientific education. But instead, the published piece centered on Carson's gender. 
Would you imagine a woman who has written about the seven seas and their wonders to be a hardy physical type? Not Miss Carson. She is small and slender with chestnut hair and eyes whose colors has something of both green and blue of seawater. She is trim and feminine, wears soft pink nail polish, and uses lipstick and powder expertly, but sparingly. <laughs> Now, a decade later, uh, when Silent Spring was published in 1960, there remained many of these quaint notions in the press about women scientists. But added to this at the time was the specter of the Cold War and an all-out campaign by the pesticide industry to discredit Carson and her ideas. So regarding the Cold War, in Silent Spring, Carson deliberately employed rhetoric of the times. In, the, um, in her tone of moral crisis to persuade readers of the urgency of her message and about the misuse of pesticides. It was for her perfectly analogous to the threat of radioactive fallout and justified her criticism of the government and the scientific establishment as well as her implicit call for citizen action. While acknowledging the volatile culture that received, uh, her message, one reviewer nonetheless accused her of emotionalism. It isn't enough to have the threat of atomic warfare, a population explosion, communist aggression, youth dereliction, and other menaces, he wrote. We must also face the prediction that chemical warfare against insects is contaminating our air, our sea, and ground. And uh, finally, a political cartoon at the time captured the public <coughs> mood by showing a well-dressed gentleman at a restaurant with a friend bemoaning his state of crisis overload. The caption, I just got adjusted to radioactive fallout, and now along comes Rachel Carson. <laughs> Um, a pesticide industry trade group uh, spent well over $250,000, this is in 1960, in its effort to persuade the public of Carson's errors and to protect its threatened <laughs> interests, seeking to discredit her as a scientist by ridiculing her evidence as well as her conclusions. And all of this, of course, played out in the media. Now, let's consider for a moment the state of science journalism 50 years ago. <laughs> It was not sophisticated. There were few journalists with the expertise to cover science. The majority of news stories were written by general assignment reporters. This produced news coverage that was little more than gee whiz stories. Gee whiz, scientists have discovered this. Gee whiz, scientists have discovered that. And um, also consider this insight from a study 30 years ago out of MIT of US magazines from 1910 to 1955, this study revealed that when female scientists have been visible in the mass media, they were portrayed as unusual. And this media treatment of women scientists left the impression that they were usually um, one of two extreme positions, either subordinate assistants or super scientists, nothing in between. Now, over the decades, I'm happy to tell you that science news reporting has improved tremendously. And today, there are thousands of science journalists and freelance writers, many with advanced science degrees. However, the process of popularizing scientific knowledge does tend, if we're not careful, to focus on personalities and social events, particularly when it comes to women scientists. And here is a telling recent example. In March of this year, Dr. Yvonne Brill, a brilliant scientist, died at the age of 88. Here is the lead to her New York Times obituary. She made a mean beef stroganoff, followed her husband from job to job, and took eight years off from work to raise three children. It is not until several paragraphs later that readers learn during her storied career, she patented a propulsion system that would later be used for communication satellites. She was also honored by NASA, inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and presented with the National Medal of Technology and Innovation from President Obama in 2011. Those accomplishments were not lost on Times readers and bloggers who royally slammed the newspaper. 
And the online version of this obituary was immediately corrected. And now if you look it up, it reads, she was a brilliant rocket scientist. <laughs> to conclude um, on a much needed positive note, just prior to the Yvonne Brill obituary brouhaha, a science writer named Anne Finkbeiner blogged about an assignment she has to interview a woman astronomer. And her blog headline is, What I'm Not Going to Do. And she writes, I'm going to write a profile of an impressive astronomer and not once mention that she's a woman. I am not going to mention her husband's job or her childcare arrangements or how she nurtures her students or how she was taken aback by the competitiveness in her field. I'm not going to interview her women students and elicit raves about her as a role model. I'm going to blindly, aggressively, egregiously ignore her gender. I'm going to pretend she's just an astronomer. Now this blog has, received, has been widely distributed, discussed, and applauded by other science writers. One writer went so far as to formulate the Finkbeiner test based on these precepts, and it is gaining traction. There is now a Finkbeiner test entry on Wikipedia. <laughs> In conclusion, until all writers adopt, adopt this attitude, women scientists need to be on the lookout and to call a timeout when fielding interview questions that wander into these mundane areas. And as readers and viewers, I call upon you to take publications and broadcast outlets to task if this is the tone of the news stories they produce. Otherwise, the risk is more women as anomaly stories that, um, and a mindset that accomplished women in science continue to be an anomaly. Thank you. As was stated, my name is Christina Deckard. I go by Chris uh, most of the time, but uh, a lot of times it's really worthwhile to put Christina so that I don't get the mister, which comes in a lot of my emails um, because they don't think that um, the scientist uh, is going to be a female, so I shock them. Uh, anyway, uh, I am honored to be here and uh, great to see all your faces. Uh, so as was mentioned, I have degrees in physics and mathematics. I currently work at Space and Naval Warfare Systems Center Pacific. It's a big mouthful. Um, but we're um, the Navy Research Lab that is here on, on Point Loma. And I've been there for 30 years. Um, but what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to start from the beginning. So I want to go back to when I was a senior in high school. So while I was in high school, um, I was college bound, and, but I was undeclared, which was something you could do. You could actually be you know, undeclared, which now it's very difficult um, to be undeclared. Uh, so I really had no idea what I wanted to do. I was good at most subjects. I was very good at math, but no one along the way had said, hey, maybe you should do this, or hey, here's some opportunities that might be available for you. So um, one of the things that happened to me in the fall semester of my senior year at high school was that I had a chemistry teacher. And he had the opportunity to take one student to an event that was occurring over a weekend at San Diego State. And it was a Thomas Alva Edison um, celebration. So it was all about science. And, and I was like, oh, cool. OK, I got to get out of class on Friday. That sounded like a really good thing. So they took us to a lot of different places. I know we went to General Atomics and saw the particle accelerator. Um, we went to other locations, had other activities that we got to do. but. Those are very vague in my mind. But the one that impressed me the most was actually a lecture that we went to. And I think it was just chosen by chance, because there were a lot of things going on. And I went to a lecture. And that lecture had Dr. Tung Zhang from Lake Forest uh, College in Lake Forest, Illinois. And he was the pioneer in moving holograms. And they had one of the first moving holograms shown to us. And so it was a couple dancing. And I mean, it wasn't anything compared to what we have now. But I looked at that, and I just turned to my chemistry teacher and said, oh my 
gosh, this is cool stuff. I need to do that, you know? Yeah, I know now. Yeah, I wanna do this when I go to college, so what do I need to do? And he said, you need to study physics. And I'm like, okay, I'll study physics. <laughs> and, then, and then I thought for a moment and I turned, so, and I said, so what's physics? <laughs> you know, I don't know what that is. So I, I ended up running off um, to a prestigious university, which I will not name, uh, but it was 1978, and at that time, uh, many of the universities um, did not have the vision um, that I had that a female could be in the physics department. So I shocked them, and they were a little bit you know, put off and really didn't see that a female should be in their physics department because they'd never had any, and, and, and that was common. So that was kind of, there was a lot of areas that that was happening in. So I just kind of went, oh, okay, well, we have to do these general ed stuff anyway. So I just kind of did general ed, took lots of math classes, which was really good, um, you know, and maybe thought, oh, maybe I'll do math. But uh, circumstances made it so that I ended up having to come back to San Diego, so I'm native San Diegan, and I came back here and, uh, you know, through a um, number, of, number of schools, ended up San Diego State graduating top of the physics class um, in 1983 with my bachelor's. There were three females, but there were three of us um, together in the physics department through those years, and two, two of us took the top two slots. So that kind of discounted all this other thing that we were hearing that, yeah, maybe the females aren't so good at this physics thing. So, um, so that's kind of um, you know where what I did, I had to make the conscious effort to follow my dreams because people were telling me no. And so, you know, I, at first I just said, okay. Um, I was 17 at the time when I first went off to college and it was intimidating. So I really decided to, you know, you know, not make waves. I was too young. But then when I came back to San Diego, I think I got a little bit of a backbone, I said, wait a minute, this is my dream. No one can stop me from my dream. And so I found a way um, to make that uh, happen. So then I went off and I went to work at, um, we were a different name at the time, but at what is now uh, Spaylor Systems Center. And I started working there and there was a handful. You could count them on two hands how many female scientists or engineers that we had working there. And so we were, we kind of, you know, got together a little bit, <laughs> tried to help each other um, through a lot of a lot of issues. But I can tell you that I did have lots of issues. But I don't, you know, that's not what my focus for today is. Um, you know, I made it through, and really, what we've all found was all we had to do was put our nose to the grindstone, <laughs> you know, do our do the work that we knew we could do, show them what we could do. And then the respect came. So then it became, you know, we became genderless, so to speak, in everybody's eyes. It was just, oh, yeah, this person is really great at the job that he or she does. So today, you know, we have a few more than a handful of scientists and engineers that are female at um, Spayware System Center, but we're pretty typical in um, the numbers that we have. Um, we're still only about 17 to 20 percent um, in the science and engineering uh, fields um, at our lab. So that is a concern, and that is something that we do, that we do um, look at that. But one of the things that happened uh, was that the Department of Defense, which is what I fall under in Department of Navy, um, and uh, Spay War System Center, uh, we decided that one way that we could make a difference and try to make a dent in some of these, you know, these numbers for females or underrepresented groups in the sciences and the engineering was to actually not look at the colleges, because it's probably less likely that I'm going to take a poli-sci uh, student and say, you need to do science and engineering. You need to take the calculus courses. Probably not going to work as well at that point in time. So we looked 
back a little bit and said, well, wait, let's catch them early. Let's get them excited. Uh, so one of the things, if you recall, one of the things that I really loved when President Obama came into office in 2009, one of the first things he did was go talk at the National Science Academies. And in his talk, what he did was he basically made a call to action for the scientists and engineers um, to reach out to the K through 12 community to generate some excitement in um, the science, technology, engineering, and math. And this term STEM was coined from, uh, from that time forward. Uh, so one of the things that he, um, that he did was he said, so I want to persuade you to spend time in the classroom. So he's talking to the scientists, uh, talking and showing young people what it what it is that your work can mean and what it means to you. So who better to go out and inspire the next generation, scientists and engineers and tech technologists, than those that are doing it. So hopefully we have a little bit of passion in what we, in what we have. So uh, about five years ago at Spayor, we stood up uh, a, um, started small, little grassroots, but it grew to be a large K through 12 outreach program. And so the goal was to reach out and bring our excitement that we have out into the community so that we could excite others into doing things that we're doing so that we could get more of the students that are at the universities and then get them um, in the fields. And for me, one of the big things that I wanted to ensure was that we were reaching out to women because I had had firsthand experience with being told I couldn't do something and that, you know, that a woman shouldn't be able to do that. And while we've progressed so far from there, there's still a long way um, that we can go. So um, some of the things that, that we do is uh, we actually have for middle school and high school girls, we put on events uh, and have specific internship programs and also um, academies where we bring these girls in or we go to a university and we expose them. So the um, American Association for University Women came out in 2010 with a, um, with a report that was called Why So Few? And it was looking at why are there so few women in these um, science and engineering fields. And so there was a lot about that the stereotyping is there, a lot of cultural um, and um, social factors that contribute to this. But one of the things that we found when we went out into the communities for almost everyone, and especially the girls, was they had no idea that these opportunities even existed. So they didn't even know about all the different fields in the science, science areas and, the, um, uh, and in the <coughs> engineerings. So, um, so I feel really privileged. I get, to, um, uh, I get to help run our internship program where we pull in high school and college students. And I am really excited when we have lots of women. And this year, we actually have a lot of females that are coming through our doors um, through these programs. Um, and um, so and I'm just really excited to be able to um, inspire these young females in the way, I hope, that Dr. Zhang inspired me with probably a 20 minute demonstration, I can still see that in my mind. It's still burned in my heart and soul that, you know, that just created the passion for me. Um, so uh, anyway, so I really wanna just say to all of you that it's really up to us to make the change and change the world. So if you like to follow the words of Gandhi, um, you can follow this, so you must be the change you wish, wish to see in this world. Or, if you like Dr. Seuss and, and the, lor the, what is it, the Lorax, yeah, um, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. <laughs> so thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dorothy Sears, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, 
Who knew there was so much traffic between UCSD and the <laughs> museum? Good Lord. Um, anyway, um, so I'll start a little bit about how I got interested in science. Um, I, uh, I was very fortunate and that my parents weren't trying to guide me into any particular pigeonhole. Um, they were not scientists. Uh, we only have one scientist, distant cousin in the family. Um, so I was really fortunate, just kind of trudging along through school. I kind of enjoyed math and, and some science, although I can't say in junior high school that I had really anything interesting presented to me about science. And then um, when I went to high school, I was lucky to be in a magnet program um, where uh, the first biology class that I had was had, had an amazing instructor. He was a young guy, about 27 years old. He had just come back from studying marine biology in Hawaii. He had, you know, the full tan. He was wearing the old, you know, early 80s Hawaiian shirt and the OP corduroy shorts. I'm not kidding you, and flip flops. <laughs> and, you know, when he started talking about DNA and how the DNA leads to the production of the RNA and that guides the production of proteins, and I mean, he's like, Chalk is flying all over the board, and he, his whole body is in it. He's literally going like this. And I was just, you know, eyes wide open. I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to study DNA. And so I came up with this term. I was going to be a genetic engineer. And I'd tell my parents' friends that when I, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm going to be a genetic engineer. And people would say, well, that requires a lot of math, right? And I'm like, yeah, no, no. Not, maybe not so much, but, uh, but that was what I wanted to do, and it was really through college that I was going to be a genetic engineer from 10th grade. Um, I also had an amazing chemistry professor who was a woman. I had her, I had both of these folks for two years um, each, but she was also amazing and just made chemistry approachable um, and fun. She, we made, uh, we, we, she was teaching us about how gases expand when you heat them, and so we made popcorn, because when you heat the popcorn, the gas in the kernel expands and that thing explodes. I mean, how awesome is that? You get to eat your experiment at the end. And we also made ice cream, too. <laughs> um, so I had, those were my two key inspirations in high school, and also, as I say, just not having anybody I couldn't say, tell me that I couldn't do it. So I was very lucky in that respect. And I have actually encountered women since then, I'll get to it, how I did, but women who today, not kidding you, two years ago, this gal I met said her physics professor in um, 11th grade told her she couldn't be a physicist. Two years ago, I, I wanted to hunt that guy down. <laughs> like, what are you doing? It's crazy. So I never had any of that. So I, so I went to college. You know, and I was going to, well, they didn't have gene genetic engineering as a major, so I chose molecular biology and um, had a great time doing that. And um, I've, I've had a, a somewhat um, stereotypical, not stereotypical, um, kind of um, what some people think is a typical path, a career path, where I just, I wanted to do science and I went to get my degree and got that and then I decided, worked at a company for a couple summers and decided that I didn't want to be doing other people's experiments, I wanted to be doing my own experiments. So like right away I knew I needed to get the PhD and um, so I went ahead and did that and been kind of on this, um, a conveyor belt of, you know, you go to grad, go graduate school, get your PhD, then you do a postdoc, and I did that. Um, so I um, uh, started doing work as a postdoctoral fellow at UCSD 17 and a half years ago. I'm literally still working in the same space, <laughs> but now as a professor. Um, in 1995, I came to do my postdoctoral work and wanted to do research that was related to human health and helping people live better lives. So I do research in the field of type 2 diabetes and um, prevention of type 2 diabetes. And as a postdoctoral fellow, I got an email one day from a group called the Association for Women in Science San Diego. And it was for a conference that they're having. And it was an all day thing on a Saturday. And I thought, huh, never heard of an organization for all women, women scientists, well, any organization for young, anybody, young people. And so this was in 2001. So I went to this conference and we, it was amazing. I, there were you know, hundreds of women there 
and um, I was amazed at how everybody was interested in helping everybody else. You know, these women were really working hard to put this conference together. There were great speakers, very inspiring, and talking about how to build your career and network and things I just had never heard about. I was kind of always just going on this conveyor belt along the way of, of um, other people around me. And so this was very unfamiliar for me. I joined the organization. And, um, and I didn't really do anything for several years. I just paid my dues and I didn't do anything. And I think I did myself a disservice. I think I've been catching up though. Um, because I wanna tell you today about the Association for Women in Science and um, for the San Diego chapter for which I am now president. <laughs> and this is my third year as president. Um, one of the things that's really been energizing about being a part of AWIS San Diego is having women work together to not get together and grouse about how we're treated, because some of us aren't treated poorly, um, but that's not what we're about. We're not about sticking it to the men or trying to get advantages, um, but just helping each other. And we do that for a variety of ways. We're doing that for our own membership, which currently we have a membership of about 370 women who primarily are graduate students, postdocs, but all the way up to the CEO level, women who are in the um, industry, biotech and pharma industry, science writers like Lynn. Lynn, you told him you were in a with, yeah, right. Sorry, I missed that part. And. Um, we have a, a broad range of careers, so one can get mentorship and guidance from all these women who have taken many different diverse paths to get to where they are and what they're doing in their careers. And we're learning about what you can do with your career, because when you're in school, you learn that, well, you, you get your degree and then you do your postdoc and then you get a faculty position. Well, that's not really <laughs> working for a lot of people. Uh, to get a faculty position, the reality is that there are a, innumerable things that you can do with a science degree. And so we can see that in the membership. So we're helping each other uh, within our membership. We also do outreach programs within the community. So um, Chris, you had talked about working with young girls. So girls that are in seventh, eighth grade, they're making the decision about whether science is cool or not, or whether they wanna do something else. So this is a critical age. And we're able to reach out to these girls um, in some ways, the most significant, I think, is through the science fair that's held here at Balboa Park. And they have uh, kind of a division for the junior high school girls and division for the high, uh, for high, junior high school students and for the high school students. And so we, every year, send a cadre of AWIS uh, gals down here to judge the girls' posters. And what we're looking for is the girls who are, um, you know, working really hard, they understand their project, they did it themselves, and they're, in, yeah, and they're interested in science. And, but they're, we're, the girl whose parents work at the Sulk, they've already drunk the Kool-Aid, right? They're gonna get a PhD. <laughs> and their poster is about MRI imaging of Alzheimer's disease patients on this or that diet treatment. I mean, those aren't, those aren't the girls we're wanting to target. We're wanting to target the girls who maybe are expressing a little bit of unsure, they're unsure about whether they wanna become a scientist or not. And so we reach out to them to encourage them, you know, science is really cool and stick with it. So we pick out of, I think, 400 posters that we looked at this year, we pick eight. We give them a $100 certificate uh, uh, check, actually, and then we have a dinner for their families and for the teacher to come. So we're able to sit down with them. We have more AWIS members that come to that, and then we can just sit and talk to them about what we do and how did we get to where we are, what kind of education we did, um, what kind of path. Mine's fairly straight, but some people like this. Um, and it's a lot of fun reaching out to these girls, and we sense, I sense, that many of them um, when we ask them, you know, what's your favorite class? You know, and you don't have to say the science class. And some of them really, they're truly unsure. Um, well, you know, I kind of like art, but you know, like, well, you know, how do you, how, wh what about your biology class? And then you get them talking about the biology class or the chemistry class or the physics class. And they're really enjoying that too. And I've had, I'd say 10 over the years say to me, Winning this award from your organization has really inspired me to stay in science and keep taking my science classes. 
because they see that real women <laughs> are doing science, that you know, we're real people, we're nice people, um, you know, we can tell jokes, maybe not the best ones. <laughs> Um, but it's a real inspiration to work with those girls. And then we have other programs um, where we uh, participate in um, hands-on kind of experiments where the kids come around. Um, we also have a scholarship program where we give, um, this year we gave seven $1,000 scholarships away to women um, all over San Diego County uh, pursuing any degree. So it can be a bachelor's degree, junior college, uh, master's degree, PhD, and we on purpose select, we make sure that we select awardees from all over the county at all these different levels. Um, and, and we recently have been tracking those gals and what they've done with, uh, since, you know, winning the scholarship from our organization. And, and to be fair, these, uh, the dollars for these scholarships come from our corporate, generous corporate sponsors. But uh, we've been following them and it's amazing because we have had eight now winners from San Diego City College MESA program. And I don't know if you're familiar with this program, but the MESA program is for, for men and women whose parents, nobody in their family has ever gone to a four-year college before. And these students are interested in mathematics, engineering, and technology, and they come into, and, and biology, and then they come to San Diego City College and there they are very closely monitored and mentored and um, given uh, study skills and all kinds of information to help them succeed. So we've had eight scholarship awardees from San Diego City College. And these gals are now, we have, there's one graduating from Harvard with her PhD soon, one just recently graduated from Rice, Stanford, MIT, one has a faculty position at Florida State. And We've actually contacted these girls, and they again attribute to, you know, their their appreciation for our support, and not so much the dollars, but just the you know you're doing a great job, stick with it kind of thing. Um, so this has been um, one of the most gratifying things that I've been doing with my career, in addition to my research. But um, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, about uh, the reporting, the, obviously that New York Times and all of the other uh, citations you, you, you gave you know, were atrocious for their, de for their sense of demeaning uh, the accomplishments of, of women. Uh, but I wonder whether um, there's, there's a, a, a lurking issue. You know, if, if, if all women scientists are reported on the same way that men scientists are reported on, i.e., you know, the sort of benchmark way of reporting science, you know, doesn't change, then might we end up with a situation where scientists are uniformly uh, regarded as dry, boring, um, and so on. I took my daughter several years ago to the AAAS conference, convention here in San Diego. Uh, she got to see, we went to the um, Ig Nobel Awards too, um, and she was put up on the stage there. Um, in, a, in a demonstration, she got to see lawyers, I mean lawyers, scientists at their, I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer, so it just suddenly came out. Um, she got to see scientists, uh, you know, at their jokingest, funniest, best. You know, and I thought that that was a great experience because she got to, to, to appreciate that there's more to science than the, than the end point. You know, there's a process, you know, a mentality, a humanness, uh, a creativity that gets there, you know, and that ought to be reported amongst all scientists, I think. So, I, 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 please. Um, thank you very much for your comment and question. And I will say, I'm glad you brought that up because as a writer, when I and other journalists, when we talk to scientists, we don't want your data, we want your ideas. And what we're really looking for are stories, and we will talk about a scientist's accomplishment, and we'll talk about the milestones in, in science, but we do it in the context of storytelling, because that is, that is the way we're hardwired, that our audiences want to, are receptive to that. So, um, and also, I think that we're, um, we're seeing now uh, younger scientists, they're, they're getting communications training at a much earlier level. And, and uh, entry point in their training and career. Uh, for those of you who are scientists here, I want to make a plug for an excellent book called Explaining Research. And it's out of Oxford University Press. The um, author is Dennis Meredith. 
and he had a just glorious science communications career at Caltech, Cornell, Duke University. Prior to that, he was an editor at MIT Technology Review. And this book is written specifically for scientists and engineers, and it will take you all through the communications process. Why to do it, how to do it, how to avoid pitfalls. A few months ago, there was a, a female senator who said that one of the, her best preparations for working in the Senate was being a mother because she had spent a lifetime handling unruly children day in and day out. And I, I thought it was emblematic of the different experiences we bring to how we approach problems and difficulties. And in, in looking back at, at fundamental science over the past hundreds of years, it's been mostly Western white guys coming up with the fundamental theories, Mendel or Einstein and so on and so forth. And I'm wondering, as you all have advanced through your careers, if you're looking at things and saying, you know, what's going on here? This doesn't make sense. And, and does bringing a feminine perspective or a diverse perspective to it really make us take a step back and saying, you know, either competition or win-lose or, or whatever those more masculine traits are, uh, how has that impeded our progress because we just haven't been able to take the blinders off and see a broader perspective? So I think that's really, that's really a good point, and that's one of the things that, um, that we, especially Department of Defense, is really looking at, that we've been very one-sided um, uh, and very white male um, in, our, in our efforts with science. But one of the things that we are trying to do is to promote that, that we, that we to succeed, and to succeed in this, you know, in the global economy that we're having to fight through now, uh, that we have to be, we have to take um, all the perspectives from a diverse group of people, and that includes women, that includes those of us that have been mothers. I, I mean, we all bring our own perspective and creativity, and if we just stay in one, you know, in, in one little box, then we won't get very far. So I think I appreciate that. That was a great point. Yeah, I want to add that um, science today is progressing to be multidisciplinary. And so back in the day when you had Mendel and you know Einstein, these guys were working nearly by themselves. You know, they're kind of in their own sphere and then they go to conferences and stuff. But not really working at teams where you have lots of different scientists contributing. And I think the nature of biomedical sciences, at least today, art, you have to have a transdisciplinary team. And I'm actually part of such a team at UCSD funded by the NIH. And it has been an amazing experience for me because in my division, um, I am now the one woman faculty member in my division who works full time out of 36 members. <laughs> It's unusual at UCSD, but suffice it to say, this is the environment that I've been kind of growing up in as a professor. Now I'm with, working with this amazing team, which happens to consist 90% of women, but women work well in teams. And so I see um, an interesting trend where um, this, new, this new paradigm of team science um, is going to be really um, facilitated and will benefit from um, more women scientists uh, being part of the teams. I've had a, a career in biotechnology, a 30-year career, and I've been very fortunate to have had both women and men mentors who were excellent and uh, who made it enjoyable uh, to, to continue uh, working in science. Uh, having said that, over the years, um, I, and to the point where I am now, there, there, are, there is a change that we really haven't talked about. It's probably been implied. And that's that the um, male white men that we've been talking about are getting older. And they're being replaced with young white men. <laughs> and currently, I'm very involved in mentoring uh, people who want to transition from academia into biotechnology and industry, both males and females. And you made me think of the fact that, wow, you know, we're now in a position where women can mentor young men. And if we're serious about what we envision in the future, working in teams, working together, collaborating, academia, uh, industry, et cetera, we, have to ha we're gonna ha we envision both men and women working uh, equitably um, uh, on these projects. 
So uh, my question to you and to your organizations is, uh, what are you doing to ensure that we can capture these, this new crop of young men early to, to know and understand and be able to collaborate and respect women? Almost a genderless kind of situation is what, what I um, would want to describe it as, so that when they get to those positions, both the men and the women get to those positions of authority, they respect one another, and we're, you know we're putting behind this previous generation of uh, you know working in silos and uh, segregating women. I still feel we segregate women. Uh, you know, once I used to belong to AWIS many years ago and to other female um, you know focused. Um, organizations, and I've really gotten away from that over the years. Uh, recently, there was a, a chapter of Women in Biotech. I don't know if you've heard that. They're opening their, they had their first meeting here in San Diego to have a Southern California chapter. And I was really thrilled when I saw that there were six guys in the audience. <laughs> and I said, yes, you know? And one of these days, we're going to have, you know, as mixed a population as we have here. So from your perspective and your organizations, what do you think you can do to ensure that we're getting the young men also uh, to, to change that attitude and be able to work with women respectfully, collaboratively? In industry and you know in the government, so one of the things that we're doing is for our um, new employees, so fresh out of college, um, they, they actually are required to go through lots of training and we actually had some of them came up with the idea of generating this mentoring. So they're kind of near peer mentoring. Uh, and, and so what I've seen with that as we bring in both the male, female, all the you know, uh, various ethnic <laughs> backgrounds, that what we're seeing is they're training each other and they're getting mentors who might be male, female, I have a lot of males that come to me that want you know, to, to learn from me. And, and so, I mean, I, I think we're headed in a lot of ways to not really looking at someone and saying, oh, it's a female or it's a white male or, or we're not looking at what ethnic background that we actually are seeing, oh, okay, this is a physicist and, and she has a background in lasers and I could use her on my project because of this. So it's more of what your talents are um, rather than who you happen to, what body you ha actually happen to reside in. So I've seen many strides, and I know that numerous other industry, uh, that they, they are trying to do things like that and this mentoring. So I think, I think you made a valid point. I really appreciate that, that yeah, now we are in the position to actually mentor not just the females, because I don't just do that. Uh, but we've got, we're gonna mentor the males, and that's, how great is that for them to see our styles and a female, you know, all our attributes, which sometimes a little bit too emotional, uh, but, you know, to see that and how that works and, and what works and what doesn't. So I think it's, I think that's a really great point. Mm -hmm. Just very briefly, and again, uh, referring to Athena's experience, we have found that um, our public programs, we will usually generally get about a third of the audience will be male, because what, the, what we strive for in our topics, these are workforce issues, not women's issues. And so they, they affect both. If, if people are gonna be senior managers and they're gonna have mixed staff, I mean, so, so doing that has been very, a very effective way to, um, to have a mix, and again, that's when all the networking starts and it goes on from there. One anecdote and, and an observation. Um, the anecdote is that some years ago when I was more in philosophy than in science, um, there was a professional organization where I'm old enough people would actually at panels make off-color comments about women and so on. And so some of the senior women got together and we started what we called the feminist caucus. And um, at first we were met with great hostility and, and so on, but within a year or two uh, we started putting together our own panels and programs, sort of like what you're saying Athena does. Um, and it became really the thing that if you were any of the younger men or you were a man who wanted to be cool, you had to come and participate in the feminist caucus meetings. And so when that happened, I sort of took that as a sign of, of you know, our having made it into, you know, sort of popular imagination as, as a place to go. Um, the observation is that when I teach research ethics, and I, I do this mostly, mostly to PhD students and postdoc level uh, people, so they're pretty advanced scientists at that point. 
One of the things I've started doing, I, I changed the curriculum to include a session in the research ethics course now on women and underrepresented groups in science. And what um, I've found is that actually presenting a lot of the studies that NIH, NSF, and other organizations have done about the discrimination in science and the disparate sort of uh, promotion and, and so on is something that many of the trainees are just completely unaware of, both male and female. And that when you put it in the context of, look, we're being trained as scientists, we're supposed to be objective. And here's a study that says, you know, 467 faculty members looked at two different, or at the same, you know, resume and CV, and one had a male name and one had a female, and the results were clearly different. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I think both my male and female graduate and postdoc uh, trainees are really surprised to hear that. So I think, you know, one thing isn't to assume that we're all aware of this and indifferent. Some of this really is, I think, a matter of people not being aware of some of the relevant social psychology research that's been done on the way bias maintains itself unconsciously, and that all of us, women included, may be making certain kinds of assumptions that we need if we're going to be truly objective and truly do the, the most rigorous science, we need to correct for those kinds of uh, biases. So I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that, but. That's excellent that you bring it up because also in the study that the professors who were picking you know, the male candidate more than the female candidate included women doing that too and to the same extent that the men were doing it. And I think that in many cases, whether it's um, you know, an ethnic bias or a gender bias, we all have biases and we're not necessarily aware of them. And um, they might present themselves we might exhibit those in ways that we're not conscious of or aware of. But, um, but having these kinds of research um, data brought to light, I think, helps us look inside and say, hey, how, how am I doing that? And how do right, I? And it's not just the men who are doing it That's and the right. women who are you know, also lovely. It's we're both doing it. You know, all the genders are doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that I can say for everything that we've talked about tonight, it's really awareness. So bringing, you know, by you coming here, you know, that that's wonderful because you are wanting to be aware and keep abreast of things. So now it's our job to go out and share some of this um, into the community so that we provide the awareness so that we can break down all these barriers. I don't think that we ever will be able to. I think I, I just think that that's a little bit unrealistic. I don't know. I mean, I'm hopeful, but I think that may be a little idealistic. Uh, but we certainly can do some damage to those barriers <laughs> in bringing them down. So, but it's going to be with everyone's help. We can't just sit back and and like was stated, we have to we have to lean in, and especially as women, we got to lean in and and actually make the effort and do those things. I have to make a plug. L'Oreal, the company that sells all the lotions, is very dependent upon science, and many of its products are consumed primarily by females. They've started an amazing international award for women in science to give awards, a substantial monetary award on four continents to women in science, and they support a lot of young women in science. If you are a younger person planning on going on in science, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and L'Oreal have a booklet on women in science that you can download online. It's an excellent booklet, and it deals with many of these issues. So it's a really great uh, example with case studies, and I, th I think you might really like that. And I applaud them for making more awards for women that are really prominent and important. So we should say thanks once again to our panelists Lynn, Chris, and Dorothy, it's really been a, an insightful and wonderful evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>